In class, we've learned about Edo period and its cultures. When speaking of Edo Japan or any pre modern Japanese history, you might instantly think of samurai shoguns such as Tokugawa Ieyasu, who completed the unification of Japan in the early 17th century. However, the Edo period is also the time when many of Japanese unique cultures started taking shape and became widespread. Although each art and culture produced in Edo periods are long persistent and still valued by many people both in Japan and from abroad, the strength of the Edo culture is its breadth and its diversity. Also, the important fact in this prosperity of culture during this era is that more commoners, even the poorers, started to consume artifacts such as custom-made comb and ornament helping. Those handmade artifacts represent its flourishing culture among people in Edo. Even the remotest local areas from Edo also made progress alongside its cultural flourishment. Tens of millions of people were very actively engaged in producing local specialties, such as the rare kinds of trees, flowers, and rocks. Those wide networks of cultural artworks also incidentally created stronger paths for transportation through land, river, and the sea. As a comparison to the culture in Osaka and Kyoto, which was called Kamigata at the time, meaning upper region, Edo culture was more widely accepted from the center of upper class warrior status to the surrounding areas than those of elitist culture in Kamigata. This wide acceptance of Edo culture was largely thanks to the practice of Sankin Kotai, or ultimate attendance that we learned in the lecture as well. This practice was also one of the symbols that represent Edo periods. To review it, it is the system that Tokugawa Bakufu strictly imposed on daimyo to limit their ability to label his regime by making it mandatory for daimyo to live in Edo and the province in alternate years, leaving their families in Edo so that daimyo would live within reach of Tokugawa Bakufu for half of their lifetime alternatively. Especially, what was the hit word in Edo culture was called ukiyo. Ukiyo is the idea that originally came from Buddhist context concept of transitory nature of life. The direct translation of Ukiyo is the floating world, and this concept is seen in a lot of Edo cultural artifacts. After the class, we started wondering why is the one what is the one that played the central role in all these Edo cultures? So we decided to find it out by ourselves using the time machine that WSU invented one year ago. We were looking for something that was playing a major role in this ukiyo sentimental life. We walked around the town and we found kabuki, geisha, bushido, and etc. Then we realized a very important thing. Everything we just saw had something in common. It was a wood block. The reason why the wood, print, wood block printing was the center of the Edo culture was because ukiyo e, the famous wood brick works that were associated with ukiyo, played a role in capturing and informing the people of the trend of the culture. In this period, there was no mass media like newspapers or magazines, but instead, the ukiyo was the things where people get a significant amount of information from trendy fashion to even actors who played in kabuki theaters. In the early age of wood brick printing in the late 17th century and early 18th century, the women subject were very popular. But from the from the early 19th century, the landscape was in its age. The other subjects included animals, nature, tools, and whatever that caught the feeling of ukiyo. An ukiyo story. 
known to his close friends and relatives as Momokusai. Momokusai lived in an average-sized coastal town in Tosa Province, Japan. Lately, the local markets and brothels have been stirring. After a long day, many have taken to the brothels at night for some nightly livery after a hard, long workday. Often, these nightly activities and commotion create quite the scene, and many woodblock prints at the market have taken these as inspiration. These prints always fascinated Momokusai, to the point where it drove his curiosity to the source, and he got to meet his first woodcarver. Momokusai gained two valuable gifts from this meeting. First, he got to sit and watch the experienced woodcarver carve his block. And secondly, Momokusai was fortunate enough to receive a dull knife and a rough wooden block on the promise that he would sharpen the knife and attempt his first woodcarving. Seeking inspiration in a flat stone, Mokuzai went on a search for both. Like many of his fellow townspeople, Mokuzai found himself at the local brothel, a constant source of censorship from the Tokugawa ideal, yet many came and chatted, commerced, and criticized. Kabuki plays, the finest ladies, and of course, the token woodblock prints to buy. Beautiful landscapes, erotic stories, depictions of life, land, the people, its actors, Far from the high arts of oil paint and calligraphy, Mokuzai gazed upon a gallery of his gift for the workmen. A simple wooden block. Owned in both inspiration and sharpening, stone and edge knife in hand, Mokuzai gazed upon the wooden block and began his work. As some samurai had began peering into both local markets and their nightly activities, Mokuzai silently formed the impression of his samurai garnering the attention and jealousy of others. Momokuzai had done it. At the very least, he had achieved attention. Returning with his first carving, he impressed the printmaker, who in turn impressed Momokuzai's block into print itself. While only a lonely workman and merchant, Momokuzai's prints gained popularity. And popularity gathered money and social mobility, a frightening thing for the ruling nobility, yet proving an exhaustive force to completely censor. It proved difficult to prevent the artistic whims of the simple carver. Momokuzai put to print his desired inspirations and commissions alike, his naval depictions gaining renown in the coastal town, and from increasingly noble backgrounds. Empowered by both money and renown, Momokuzai's eyes and hands impressed whatever he decided to do. Sometimes it got him into trouble, but often it slipped through the cracks. Getting frustrated with his notoriously tough censor official, rumored so for his distant relations to some Tokugawa member, or so he constantly recounts, Momokuzai's taste for a bit too gruesome action, erotic tales, and unhinged kabuki drama drew furious rage from the censor's rare encounter with the lowly art form. As chance dictated, the old censor's claims were no lie and this distant Tokugawa's entourage came to check on the coastal town's condition. On a stroll through town, Momokuzai strolled past the procession, displaying his respect and greeting for the nervous old censor and this powerful Tokugawa elite. The censor's name broke with a comment. What shameful work have you got in that bag of yours, miscreant? Momokuzai's fate had been sealed. At first, tempting his fate, and gifting his finest, latest work to the Tokugawa official, the strength of the coast, the official's interest proved deadly, and his inquiry for the rest of the work in his bag, in company with the censor's rapid demands, unveiled the latest batch of Mimokuzai's raw interpretation of society, the common people's fervor for action, pleasure, and drama, a distraction from their long, hard, everyday lives, and the nightly social activities they frequently engaged in. The censor's embarrassment and rage shadowed the elite official's solemn disgust. Both the old censor and Momokuzai were imprisoned and silenced. A new wave of censorship fell upon the townsfolk. The official left, and life returned to habit. The carvers continued carving, the actors acted, the men drank and distracted themselves. Then, the printers printed, and life went on despite the circumstances. The ukiyo-e had served its role in hollowing out a part of Japan's feudal society, readying it.
for the rapid modernization would soon befall.